What got you there with got you got you What got you there with Shonda Lane? Hello. So today I am doing another one of my distillation episodes. And this one is going to be on Josh Waitskin. First of each month, I release a very thorough deep dive on someone I've learned a lot from, someone whose learning process, creative process, uh, I really enjoy. So uh, I've done Josh Waitskin, um, the F1 CEO, Total Wolf, uh, legendary investor, Yen Liao, uh, Nick Kikonis. Um, So th- this is something that I really enjoy putting together each month. And if you guys want to take a, a look at it, um, you can go to whatgotyouthere.com and just click on uh, the distillery. And, and there you can stay up to date and subscribe to it. And so today I, I'm doing Josh Waitskin. And so what I love so much about Josh Waitskin is just, I mean, he's a true polymath, a Renaissance man, someone who has knowledge and talents in, in multiple domains. Uh, he He's actually pretty remarkable in terms of what he's done. He, he was a national chess champion at the age of nine, um, but he didn't stop there. He, he went and then progressed into the, the martial arts, Tai Chi Chuan uh, push hands, and he actually became a, a world champion there. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, and he's also now taking on um, what's called e-foiling in, in the surfing world. So if you really want to understand someone who can who can apply the lessons they've learned across multiple domains, there, there's few people in the world as talented jo- as Josh. And, and he's someone who's like really in search of wisdom and just trying to figure out those foundational principles and, and a better way of going through life. And what I also love is that he understands this is all an inner journey. Everything he's doing at the end of the day is about that. And so when I think of Josh Waitzkin, I think of like vitality, love that has driven his super normal learning achievements. When I see words that best point to his character and values, their, their passion, joy, introspection, intuition, integrity, authenticity, creativity, self-expression, and unlearning come to mind. And, and you can just kind of understand what it takes to be truly great by studying Josh. That's what we do. So that's what this distillation is going to be. Um, I, I'm going to go through the majority of this distillation um, online is going to be way more in, in depth and thorough, a lot more quotes, a lot more deep dives. And then at the end of this, I'll also um, uncover and reveal Josh's 20 learning principles, which, which I think are, are just incredible. Um, and believe me, you guys, I'm sure are going to want to go back in and read this. So you can just find this at whatgotyouthere.com. So key themes that are, that are going to come out are unobstructed self-expression. That's one of the key things that drives everything he does. Also, thematic learning, learning in, in different themes, and then how can you apply those themes to different domains? Another thing is depth over breath. Josh goes super deep on topics as opposed to, to what the majority of people do, and they just try to do as many different things. He, he understands quality and goes really deep on things. And another thing he does is he goes towards stress tension and weaknesses. Another big theme that seems to come up is is he understands life works in oscillation, right? Like stress plus rest equal recovery. Um, And and you can't have a a life without understanding the oscillation points. So those are some of the big themes we'll cover. Um, There's also going to be a lot of other sub themes and major principles we uncover. So let's dive into this. And so he says the key to pursuing excellence is to embrace an organic level of static, safe mediocrity usually growth comes at the expense of previous comfort or safety. And so in my experience, successful people shoot for the stars. They put their heart on the line in every battle and ultimately discover that the lessons learned from the pursuit of excellence mean much more than the immediate trophies and glory. In the long run, painful losses may prove much more valuable than wins. Those who are armed with a healthy attitude and are able to draw wisdom from every experience, good or bad, are the ones that make it down the road. They are also the ones who are happier along the way. It's such a great encapsulation um, about what it actually takes, right? Like we, we so many times just want this quick, immediate reward. And we, we think life should just be completely happy, but we forget the, the opposite of those actually gives meaning, right? Like you can't have light without darkness. You, you can't have happiness without pain. And, and so it's really important to understand that. And, and he also has such a childlike approach to things. And he says, those who exceed at the elite level of any discipline have built relationships to learning around subtle, introspective sensitivity. They understand how their minds work and both cultivate strengths and take on weaknesses through their unique natural voice. They have learned to open communication between their conscious and their unconscious minds and construct repertoires around moments of creative inspiration. They've built triggers for their peak performance states learned how to funnel emotion into deep focus, turned adversity to their advantage as a way of life. And they have done all of this 
in a matter and language that feels natural to them. This is how they seem so unobstructed, so fluid. They are just being themselves like children. It's that beginner's mind, that, that curiosity perspective. And, and next up is one of my favorite quotes um, I've, I've come across. And he says, and this is all around competence. He says, but there's a competence that goes into things. And it's the thing where you can walk into a room where no one believes in you, but yourself, but your self-belief is so profound that you're unstoppable. The way I relate to that, if you try to deconstruct it, is that the sense of inevitability of success comes from self-expression, from knowing that you're playing your game and you're playing your game better than anyone else in the world could. And you build everything around the uniqueness of who, who you are. Wow. I mean, like talk about an incredible empowering quote, right? Like when, when you can walk into your room and you know any room and you know you're playing your game, it doesn't matter who else is in the room or trying to play someone else. It's all about your game. And there's this confidence, this inner knowing when you're operating from that place. I think this is so important. Um, we always say like run your own race. It's, it's the same thing. Like know this, know the foundation that that you're built on. It's just so cool, so crucial to have that. Another thing he says, if I've learned anything over my first 29 years, is that we cannot calculate our important contest adventures and great loves to the end. The only thing we can really count on is getting surprised. No matter how much preparation we do in the real test of our lives will be an unfamiliar terrain. Conditions might not be calm or reasonable. It may feel as though the whole world is stacked against us. This is when we have to perform better than we ever have conceived of performing. I believe the key is to have prepared in a manner that allows for inspiration to have laid the foundation for us to create under the wildest pressures we ever imagined. In the end, mastery involves discovering the most resonant information and integrating it so deeply and fully it disappears and al allows us to, to fly free. I mean, so crucial, right? Like prepare for the worst case scenarios. And then when you meet those scenarios, you, you're prepared for them, right? Like unfamiliar terrain, which is something we're all going to face, doesn't feel so unfamiliar when, when we've trained in, in the most ridiculous environments. So the so next big thing we're diving into is, is that concept he has around unobstructed self-expression. And he, he says, everything I've done when I've been flying in my learning process, in my performance psychology, my competitive energy, it's been a form of self-expression, love. And when I've been obstructed, I've been trying to fit into the mold that wasn't right for me, right? Like trying to fit into the mold that we, we think others want us to abide by. And that's not, that's not how it goes. To be truly elite, you have to express who you are at the core through your art. I believe that one of the most critical factors in the transition becoming a conscious high performer is the degree to which your relationship to your pursuit stays in harmony with your unique disposition. This is a similar theme to how Bruce Lee led his life. Bruce believed in honest self-expression and all that you do is the utmost important. Uh, and Josh trained himself to be true to himself. And that's when he works at his best. I think that's when everyone works at their best, when they're truly core uh, or being true to their core. And that, that's just crucial. I, I wish more people approached it this way. And, and there will be an inevitability be times when we try new ideas, release our current knowledge, or take in new information. But it's critical to integrate that new information in a matter that doesn't violate who we are. By taking away our natural voice, we leave ourselves with a center of gravity to balance us as we navigate countless obstacles that are inevitable uh, along the way. Josh really hits on this, that it's it's about embracing your funk, right? Like you're embrace your eccentricity, embrace your uniqueness, all of those things, right? Like they might say like what, call, what, what you get called crazy for. That's so cr crucial to who you are. And when you can unleash that and just be true to yourself, um, that's when you do your best. And I always trusted that if I was true to myself, these great things, they would follow, right? Like that they say as a child, like follow your curiosities, follow your heart, follow your dreams. And when you're really going all in on that, certain doors just tend to open up because of that. Another one of the, the big frameworks Josh has that, that I think is crucial and, and one that I've really tried to integrate into my life is, is living on the other side of pain. And what he says is I've trained for many, many years at this principle of living on the other side of pain, learning to turn what feels uncomfortable, learning to turn that place of mental resistance at the stretch point into something that I crave, that I love, and I enjoy. To achieve excellence, a counterintuitive notion is most people seek to avoid pain and discomfort. But after you achieve some mastery, you learn to ignore the pain. You must seek it out and embrace it. It's all about embracing that pain, those stretch points. Um, and, and so most people avoid those stretch points in life, right? Like, and that's why they remain mediocre. They don't want to push 
their bounds. And so they never grow, right? Like life works in oscillation. And so if we can get comfortable, we can live at our stretch points. There's going to be pain and pain can be physical or it can be mental resistance. A lot of us experience that mental resistance, but we can change our relationship um, to the discomfort. Um, if we get hungry uh, around our edge and around our growth, that's so crucial. And so I'm always looking for ways to push myself so I don't stop craving the dynamic edge. We can train ourselves to do that. It's like a habit, right? Um, you, you hear it a lot. Josh talks about this with, with going to ice baths, right? Like as long as you can reshape your relationship with that, you can plunge into that freezing cold ice bath and you can learn to handle it. Everything in life is like that as we go towards our stretch points. I mean, he says, wouldn't it be liberating that in the moments of pain to realize it will lead to the great insight and going into it, put our hearts on the line, but you know that if it doesn't work out, we will learn. People often take that and go too far saying it doesn't matter, win, lose, and they don't fully engage. You have to fully engage, but also understand that disappointments provide the greatest insights. When we lay our hearts on the line, we feel pain most people don't feel because they're not all in. And when you're all in, it opens deep reservoirs of human experience. First, you feel pain, the panic, you know, like that whole get me out of here. But you must come to peace with that pain and learn to enjoy it. It's learning to completely love chaos till the tension isn't grinding on you. He, he uses the analogy of you're not a tectonic plate moving toward eruption. You're getting stronger as that tension builds. And that's something I think is beautiful to train at, right? Like if we can just reshape that relationship with pain, discomfort, and actually understand that our greatest breakthroughs are about to happen at those points, we can learn to love them. And, and that's that mental resilience. That's what world-class performers are all about. The next big theme we're hitting on here is depth over breath in the learning process. And Josh says, my approach is one that prioritizes depth, depth before breath. Almost everyone goes the other way, breath first or go wide and then deep, or maybe go wide and never go deep, which is usually what our culture tends to be moving toward. Everyone's distracted doing a million things. The theme is depth over breath. The learning principle is to plunge into the detailed mystery of the micro in order to understand what makes the macro tick. This has the potential to distinguish success from failure in the pursuit of excellence. So like in our world today, everyone's racing to learn, 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 and discover all these new things, but nothing's done deeply, right? There, there's no essence of quality in, in any of this. And if you do something with incredible depth, you develop that feel for quality. And so he says, what I want for my kids, I want them to explore quality and love and have them just feel beautiful or how it is to feel beautiful when you go deep into an art uh, that you're so passionate about. I, I was really lucky when I was growing up. Um, so I started playing lacrosse right around fifth grade. And I, I just purely fell in love with that sport, every element of it. And I started to just to, to find these subtle things within the sport, right? Like how you hold the stick, how you cradle, how you shoot. And that depth, I just kept going further and further. And when you go further, you uncover so much more. And I just love that. So when Josh talks about this, about understanding depth and then understanding quality and how that can then translate to everything else you do in life, um, it's such an incredible I don't want to say technique at principle. And it's, it's why this is what I want for my kids, right? Like I wish, and I want them to be able to find this essence of quality, this depth into a skill, into a practice um, so that they can then take those lessons, those principles and apply them out to everything. Um, and, and so what he says is, let's say we have three skills to learn. The typical approach is that we take them all at once. It's much more effective to plunge deeply into one, touch quality, and then transfer that feeling of quality over to the others. A martial artist, for example, should internalize one technique very deeply instead of trying to learn 10 or 15 superficially. This approach engages the unconscious creative aspects of our mind, and we start making thematic connections. Thematic connections is something we'll come back into. And thematic connections which greatly accelerate growth. It is also important to point out that the deep presence is required for a state of neuroplasticity to be triggered, and our brain does not remap effectively when we are skipping along the surface. So the, the state of neuroplasticity is actually, actually, what that is, is our brain rewires. And the, the neurons that fire together, wire together. It, it's true. Like there are these car neural pathways and the more we train a skill. So he's mentioning a martial artist, the more you train a, a kick, the deeper those neural pathways actually get carved. And the key is to recognize the principle of making one simple technique tick with the same fundamentals that fueled the whole expansive system. 
Um, and, and so what that is, is really uncovering one of these techniques and, and what the key is behind that, the principle, and then you can apply that out. So, you know, depth beats breath any day of the week because it opens channels for the intangible, unconscious, creative components of our hidden potential. And when we touch quality, when we touch depth, that's when that hidden intangible, those come out. And, and where, where Josh um, discovered the, the principle of quality is from Robert Persig's book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Cycle Maintenance, which, which is the book I, I thoroughly enjoyed. And essentially what happens in this is um, the teacher has a creative writing um, to assignment test for the class. And he says to write about your hometown. And, and one of the girls in the story, she says, I, I, I can't do this. Like my town's not interesting. I, I grew up in a boring town. He says, no, 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 don't, don't focus on the whole town. Pick one building, right? Like pick the the brick church um, in your downtown. And instead of just picking that building, select one brick, just one brick. And what this this exercise did is it just unlocked her creatively. We, we realized there's so much nuance in quality, in the details. And that's what she does. She just starts writing almost unconsciously, revealing all the subtle um, little things within that single brick. And it's so beautiful. It's this incredible principle. And most people think they can wait around for the big moments to turn it on. But if you don't cultivate turning it on as a way of life in the little moments, and there's hundreds more times those little moments, the big ones, there's no chance for the big moments. And so when you uncover quality, like in a single brick, and you understand the little things within that, then when you meet these other moments, you can bring that essence of quality. Um, I, I think the, the entire concept of quality in life is so crucial. I wish more people approached life and held themselves to a high standard with quality. Another thing Josh talks about this in his great book, The Art of Learning, and that's making smaller circles. And so what making smaller circles is, is, is turning the large into the small. And uh, my understanding of this process is the spirit of my numbers to leave numbers method of chess study is to touch the essence um, of a technique and then to incrementally condense the external manifestation of this technique while keeping its true essence. So over time, expansiveness decreases while potency increases. And he calls this making smaller circles. I know that seems somewhat abstract, but the way you can think about this is, is we were talking about Bruce Lee earlier, and he famously had that one inch punch where his one inch punch was so powerful. It, it would knock grown men back 15 feet. And there was that essence of quality, right? Like making smaller circles. Bruce perfected the punch so much that he packed so much potency into one small element of what he did. And, and the key is to take small steps so the body can barely feel the condensing practice. So each little refinement is monitored by the feeling of the punch, which I gained for months or years of training with large traditional motion, right? You think about the, the motion of the punch, you spend years training the huge one. Slowly but surely, the body and your, begins to just understand the technique and it becomes more and more potent. And so what you need is you just need a little bit of movement to generate way more force than early on you needed a ton of mo um, movement and this is where making smaller circles and slowing down time and can come to play so what he when working with highly skilled and mentally tough opponents the psychological game gets increasingly subtle so the battle becomes about reading breath patterns and blinks of an eye playing in the frames the other opponent is unaware of the invisible technical manipulation that slowly creates response patterns if I understand a series of movements more deeply in more frames with more detail, then I can manipulate my opponent's intention without him realizing what happened. And, and so the, the way I think about this, I'll, I'll tie it back to the sport I grew up playing lacrosse, where when I reached advanced levels, if I was going against people earlier in their career, or, or just let's just call them beginners for ease of conversation, there were things that I was analyzing and looking at that they couldn't even conceptualize. They weren't even aware of. Um, I'd be looking at subtle movements to talk about if I was going to be taking a shot. I'd be looking at the goalie, how he's holding a stick, how he's moving, how he's balancing on the balls of his feet. Um, and so there's these little things that a novice wouldn't even think of, right? Like if you were first starting out, I don't know, you would just shoot the ball at the net and hope it goes in. Whereas you get further on depth, on quality, on mastery, there's all of these little things that you can uncover. And I think this is a, a really important principle. I, I know this is abstract, but this is making smaller circles. Um, if you want to expand on this a little bit further, I really highly recommend you pick up Josh's book, uh, The Art of Learning, where he dives deeper into this. The other one, and this is, I think, one of the most important things anyone can learn um, for the, the process of learning, and that's thematic interconnectedness. And thematic interconnectedness, or otherwise termed lateral thinking, is just the ability to take a lesson from one thing and transfer it over. 
Um, it's, it's without a doubt one of the most important principles that are cultivate a way of being. And, and one of Josh's greatest strengths as a learner is his ability of parallel learning or lateralization. Uh, he's been able to understand the foundational building blocks across different domains, ch- tests, chess, Tai Chi, um, all the martial arts and surfing. And then he can translate them from one to another, right? Like it's not going to take him the same amount of time to achieve mastery. And the next thing he goes after or pursues as it took him to achieve mastery in chess, because he understands the thematic connections. And when you learn a technique, you learn one thing. When you're learning a principle that embodies a technique, you might be learning a thousand things. And so designating a learning process around that is crucial. And so you want to internalize certain core concepts and principles. And then there's techniques that fall within the tree beneath those principles. And so he looks at that as that the meta training. And that's just such a, a crucial component. Um, I, I'm sure if you've spent a decade plus in any one domain or craft, you, you'll start to see the, these commonalities, these principles, and being able to extract them out across different domains is, is just crucial. And another thing he, he talks about that I love, it, it kind of reminds me of Jeff, Jeff Bezos' um, regret minimization framework. So he, he fast forwarded um, when he was thinking of starting Amazon and thought about his 80-year-old self. And, and the way Josh hits on this is the internal spirit is the best teacher. So Josh says, myself, 20 years from now is going to be my best teacher because no one knows me better than I do. Um, and because of that, um, you can really listen to the, the subtle nuances that your inner knowing can help you pull out, right? Like, who do you want to be 20 years from now? What are you doing right now that isn't going to get you to that place you want to be at? And if you can give yourself space, if you can sit back and really visualize that, um, you'll know, you'll, you'll know if the steps you're taking and the habits you have, are they going to get you there? And if not, what do you need to change? Um, I think this is just so important. So I actually sat down and I wrote this. Um, I wrote out pretending I was having a conversation with myself 25 years from now, um, what I was doing wrong, what I was doing right, what I wouldn't regret it having done, what I would regret having do doing. Um, it's it's so important. Um, uh, another thing that I've hit on in the past is just Galilean relativity. And, and all that is, is you don't understand the system you're in while you're currently in it. The way I think about this is you can look back and like say, oh, five years ago, I can't believe I ever did that. Why was I so stupid? It's because you don't understand what you're doing until the future, right? It's like the fish swimming in water. They don't even know they're in water. So the, the way I can think about this is if you're on a train and you're moving 50 miles an hour on that train, you don't feel like you're moving. You just feel like you're there. But from an outside observer, you can easily look and say, oh yeah, that person is moving really, really fast on that train. Same thing with, with Josh's theme here on fast forwarding your 20 year self and using that person, that person who's not on the train to give the person um, on the train some advice. I think that's really important. And, and one of the things that can really help with this is, is finding a teacher. And I think Josh is really, really good at understanding what it takes to find a teacher. And he says, the key to finding a teacher is finding someone who can truly understand us. The, the vast majority of teachers teach the way they learn. They have their way of learning and teach all their students to learn that way. By definition, that will alienate 75% of the students. Teachers teach one way and most of their students are left behind. So find the teacher that listens first. And he said, when I train people, 99% of what I do is listening, not just with dialogue, but I study them through my observation, um, reading their journals, through biometrics, dialogues with consultants. I have them work with psychologists as well. And what this does is it really gets to insights and an essence of the other person. This is so important. I saw this so much playing sports growing up. So many coaches, it's, they, they have their one process, their one system, and they just run their system. And, and you've got to learn how to adopt it. But someone like um, a, a great coach, call it in the NFL, he understands different players come in and, and he can manipulate certain things based on who each individual player is. And, and that's so crucial. Um, so if you're looking for a coach, don't just have a coach that says, this is how it's done. Um, have one who's going to understand you and this is so key. And Josh knows firsthand because he actually had a chess coach who was just trying to get him to play the way the coach played. Um, and actually this was that total tension with Josh, right? It was getting away from his principle of unobstructed self-expression. And so what you need to do is you need to teach someone in a way that is most conducive to them. You can't have an ego as a teacher, right? Like you need that student and you need to be flexible for them. Um, I just think that that's so important. 
Um, another thing when getting a teacher and when learning are, are just feedback loops. And on the learning curve, accurate feedback is criti critical. And depending on the time delay, right? Like we can have short feedback loops in sports. Uh, I took the shot I missed. All right, that's a short feedback loop. But investing, they can be really long. I place this investment. I may not know how it works out for 10 years. And so you have to get creative about how you build feedback loops in your life. So Josh talks about mentors, truth tellers, and studying the past behavior are critical resources for feedback. You have to be willing to receive feedback, though. And that's where a lot of people go wrong, right? Like they don't, they don't want feedback because the feedback can be hard. And so for a coach or a trainer to give you feedback, for you to let that feedback in, they have to know you very deeply. So there's a lot of trainers, a lot of coaches who can't get outside their own conceptual scheme. So they tell you what you should do based on what they would do or what would work for them. But what they need to understand is basically empathy, being in your shoes in those moments. So cultivating a close ecosystem of people who can tr you can trust to be honest with you, real feedback um, is going to be critical. You're, you're going to need that. Another thing that, that Josh hits on is just intuition. And he says, in my opinion, intuition is our most valuable compass in the world. It is a bridge between the unconscious and the conscious mind, and it's hugely important. So intuition and the subconscious are just reoccurring themes across great artists, athletes, innovators. Um, but it's actually not often talked about, probably because there's a stigma, right? Like you can't quantify intuition or, or what you feel it. And I always think back um, of the, the legendary investor and philanthropist, George Soros. And when he was, was feeling at odds um, with his investment portfolio, he would get this deep back pain. And when he had that back pain, he, he couldn't fully explain it, but he knew that something was at odds in his portfolio. So it would, it would take him, or he would take a, another look, a closer look. At him. And he says that pretty much every single time this ever happened, um, there was something severely off. And his, his subtle awareness was being attuned to something that hadn't played out yet. Um, and so I, I just think that's, that's really, really key um, and important to, to be okay with that intuition. And there, there's a, a part in, the, in Josh's book where he says, for much of the book, I've described my vision of the road to mastery. You start with the fundamentals, get a solid foundation fueled by understanding the principles of your discipline. Then you expand and refine your repertoire guided by your individual predispositions while keeping in touch, however abstractly, with what you feel to be the essential core of the art. What results is a network of deeply internalized, interconnected knowledge that expands from a central personal locus point. The question of the intuition relates to how that network is navigated and used as fuel for creative insight. I think like when, we, when we're really listening to ourselves deeply, we have that gut feeling, right? Like, does this feel right? Does this not? And those that have achieved the highest forms of mastery, I think they're deeply attuned to this, even if, they, even if they're unwilling to admit that. I think they can follow that core, um, that gut feeling, and it, it's just so important. And so what he does is, is he's constantly seeking out better competition um, on his path to mastery and growth. And you never know what great talent looks like until you face it. And this has been the essential co component of my growth, both in sports and business. Step into the arena with an elite competitor, and you immediately know and are aware of how little you know, or how unskilled you are. That's the best, right? Like you think you're great at something until you face someone who is truly great and just makes you feel like an absolute idiot or a total beginner. That's crucial. You have to be putting yourself, like Theodore Roosevelt said, in the arena. And so Josh says, as I cultivated my strength, I also had to take on more abstract elements of high level chess. So I could completely effectively with more seasoned opponents, just as muscles get stronger when they are pushed, good competitors tend to rise to the level of the opposition. And so what you do is you, you keep on bringing tougher and tougher opponents into your world, no matter, no matter what you're training at. Uh, it's just so crucial. It's just a great principle to embody. And, and Josh talks about this within what he calls the soft zone. And he says, I realized that in top rank competition, I couldn't count on the world being silent. So my only option was to become at peace with the noise. Mental resilience is arguably the most critical trait of a world-class performer, and it should be nurtured continuously. So the initial step along this path um, is to attain what sports psychologists call the soft zone. And you can envision the soft zone as your performance state. You are concentrating on the task at hand, whether it be a piece of music, a legal, legal brief, or driving a car, anything. Then something happens. Maybe, maybe with COVID, you're working at home. Your spouse comes in the room. Your baby wakes up, starts screaming. Your boss calls and just starts demanding things of you. 
And so the nature of your state of concentration will determine the first phase of your reaction. If you are tense with your fingers jammed in your ears and your whole body straining to fight off distraction, then you are in the hard zone that demands a cooperative world for you to function. Um, you're, you're so brittle. And Josh uses the, the analogy of a dry twig, right? Like it doesn't bend, you just snap under pressure. And as I'm sure the majority of you have seen, if you really understand or, or listen to life, is that life is not going to reorient itself for you. You've got to learn to be more flexible, right? Bruce Lee's be like water. And so the alternative is for you to be quietly, intensely focused, apparently relaxed with a serene look on your face, but inside all the mental juices are turning. You flow with whatever comes, integrating every ripple of life into your creative moment. This soft zone is resilient, like a flexible blade of grass that can move with and survive hurricane force winds. So this is crucial, right? Like this soft zone, I know a lot of people have different terms for this. Um, it, it's just being able to adapt, bend with the changing situations. I'm sure we've all seen over the past two years here that we couldn't have prepared for this, the this, this situation we're in. And so the, the more you can do that, um, it's going to be so crucial. And Josh has a great chapter in the book. It's called Making Sandals. And so what, what it basically is saying is you come across this road, you don't have any, any, you're in bare feet and you come across this road and you can try to get the, the road to completely change the earth, completely remove all the thorns. So you can walk across the land, which obviously we know never happens, or we could just make sandals to walk across the land. The sandals is the soft zone, learn how to adapt, learn how to be flexible, be like water. And so then Josh gets into the different learning phases or learning phases. And so that's unconscious incompetence, meaning like, I don't know how bad I am, right? Like that beginning stage. Then number two is the conscious incompetence. And that's the stage where we're like, this sucks. I know how bad I am. And this is actually the stage that most people quit. Um, and then the third learning phase is conscious competence. And I can do this if I focus. That's basically like the internal dialogue going on in that third stage. And then the fourth and final stage is unconscious competence. And so it's basically like when you're driving a car and you go, oh, wow, I don't remember the last 10 minutes of driving. You've gotten so good at driving that it's happening at an unconscious level. And the reason most people quit at conscious incompetence is they don't do the work to truly understand deeply enough. They're, they're too busy to put in the required time and use the time requirement as an excuse to put in that level of commitment. So it's, it's an embarrassing stage, right? Like your ego is tied up with outcomes. And at this stage, when you, you kind of suck, it's not very much fun. So most people don't like that. They don't like that tension. This is why so many of these principles Josh hits on, it, it, we can be flexible, we can de be adaptable, we can be on our own journey. Then you can put the ego aside and, and you can get through phase number two. Um, I, I like how he touches on the, these four phases of learning. I, I think it's important because then when we're in a learning process, we can step back and say, oh, what phase am I in? And what am I going to experience? What am I going to face during these phases? Because then when we know what we're going to face, we can better handle them. And another thing Josh talks about is just deconstructing. Um, and in, in order to reach a high level understanding, it's about understanding what are the component parts and doing lots of reps in them so that you're comfortable with them, then putting them all together. And in Josh's learning process, he won't look great in the beginning. Um, first couple of days, weeks, months, he's not going to look good at all as anyone would, right? Like we're not good in the beginning. And so don't let your ego get caught up in this. And so the last few years, I, I think I might've mentioned, he started the, the surfing sport e-foiling, right? It's, it, you basically have a, um, just call it uh, a shaft on the bottom of a surfboard, which allows you to continue to go on and on. Um, and so what he did is he viewed e-foiling and what he was seeing is so many people were afraid to get very good because they were concerned with doing things that didn't make them look cool in the world of social media and Instagram. Everyone just wanted the, the great shots of how they were performing on the e-foil, but so many people were afraid to fail over and over again, fall, 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 because they were afraid of it being posted. And so he says, embracing looking absurd in certain moments is a very interesting hack to what others might not be taking advantage of in the learning process. And so deconstruct those component parts, internalize those component parts. Then he says, go all in on chaos. Part of being able to go all in on chaos is having focus and presence. And if deep fluid presence becomes second nature, then life, art, and learning take on a richness that will continually surprise and delight. 
Those who excel are those who maximize each moment's creative potential. For these masters of living, presence to the day-to-day learning process is akin to that purity of focus others dream of achieving in rare, climactic moments when everything is on the line. The secret is that everything is always on the line. The more present we are at practice, the more present we will be in competition, in the boardroom, at the exam, the operating table, the big stage. If we have any hope of attaining excellence, let alone of showing what we've got under pressure, we have to be prepared by a lifestyle of reinforcement. Presence must be like breathing. Whoa. I mean, you want to talk about being there, which is crucial to learning, developing, connection, anything like that. It comes down to focus and presence. And that line at the end, presence is like, must be like breathing. Uh, It's crucial. I think that shows what he puts into um, in his craft. And he said he learned this lesson um, in his late teens, early 20s, trying to stay concentrated for eight hours a day, two weeks at a time in a world chess championships. Um, And he said he'd burn out. And when I started taking mini breaks, my endurance and quality of focus surged. Stress and recovery should be our rhythms. And physical interval training can be an excellent tool for improving mental recovery. One of many problems with multitasking is that the frenetic skipping leaves little room for relaxation and thus our reservoirs for energetic presence is constantly depleted. The way I think about this is if we're doing a a cycle of deep work, say we're going to get an hour and a half in and say you're 30 minutes in and you're going to give yourself a little break and you pull up Twitter real quick, just we forget that pulling up Twitter for those 10, 30 seconds could impact the next 20 minutes. And so what you need to do is maybe just get up, stay away from distractions, just do a quick walk, maybe do some breathing, things like that to help you stay in that state, but help you recover, not to to get refocused in something else that's going to throw you off the thing you're trying to focus on. And another thing that he talks about that has really helped with this, and I, I did this a lot, is just intense visualization. And so you basically want to feel the psychological experience within your body that you're visualizing. I know legendary Chicago Bulls and Los Angeles Los Angeles Lakers coach Phil Jackson used to do this. He says he used to just sit there and meditate and visualize for 40 minutes before a game. He wanted to visualize the experience, what it was actually going to feel like in his body during those certain moments. And Josh actually talks about this. He, uh, he injured his hand. I'm pretty sure he broke it a few weeks or months just before um, he was entering the world championships. And so what he did is he did intense visualization around his broken hand. And so he'd work out um, the hand that was still functioning correctly and he visualized the other one. And so what this was able to do is he felt like his hand was working out. He was getting the reps in, even though he wasn't. And I I know there's some scientific research that's actually backing this. It's not the same as say you broke your arm, your right arm, and you're working at your left arm. Um, It's not the same as being able to work out both arms, but it helps um, in impeding muscle loss and damage. And so I just think that process of visualizing both outcomes you want, understanding obstacles you might face is just so crucial. Another thing that Josh talks about, which is one of my favorite things is, is being at peace in chaos. And he's trained himself to not only be comfortable in chaos, but actually be at peace with it. And one of the ways he's trained being at peace in chaos is putting his body in an alarmed state, such as meditation practice and cold plunges and deconstructing is really important. And so Josh always looks for ways that he can train at this. Um, I think about this as reps hidden in plain sight. You're finding ways to train throughout everyday life. So as an example of this idea around being at peace and chaos or learning to be okay internally, even to thrive internally when your body is alarmed is, is that you train at it. You train when your body is in that alarm state. And, and so for example, with, with cold plunging, right? We were talking about that earlier. When you enter that cold plunge and all of a sudden <gasps> heart rate spikes, you're trying to catch your breath. That's being in chaos, right? And if you can learn to control yourself, your emotions, how you react in those states, then you can just apply that and all these other times in life when those states get heightened and it's hard to control them. And so if you can kind of control those states in unstressful environments, then when those environments become extremely stressful, like in real life, you're able to handle them. Um, the, the way he thinks about this is right. Like you want to be able to operate perfectly in a hurricane. Um, I think that's such a great analogy, right? Like the hurricane of life can be going all around you, but if you're operating, handling that chaos, you'll be fine. 
Um, and so first we have to learn to be at peace for, with imperfection. Um, we have to use that imperfection actually to our advantage. So that's going to be crucial. Third step in that process, um, as it pertains to performance psychology is to learn to create ripples into our consciousness, like little jolts that spur us along. So we, we are constantly inspired, um, when these moments are going on, right? Like tie back to your why, when you're operating in this chaos, well, what's happening here? Like what, why, and what can get you through those tough moments? So now we're going to dive into uh, a big theme. Most of us probably need more work on. And, and that's the entire life works in o- oscillation, um, stress plus rest equal recovery. And we're going to hit on first relaxation to improve performance. Most of us think a lot of the hard chargers are like, go, 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 and just never take your foot off the gas where putting your foot on the brake can actually be key. And, and being able to relax is a critical component of Josh's ability to improve performance. Um, as children, we might be told to, to concentrate, right? Like just sit there, concentrate, concentrate. And the second that concentration where we lose focus, it, it's considered bad. And this tendency of competitors to exhaust themselves between rounds of tournaments are surprisingly widespread and really destructive. And so he says, when whenever I visit Scholastic Chess events today, I see coaches trying to make themselves feel useful, useful or showing off for parents by teaching students long technical lessons immediately following a two-hour game and an hour before the next round. He says, let kids rest. Fueling up is much more important than last-minute cramming, and at a higher level, the ability to recover will be pivotal. I saw this all the time in sports. Uh, I'd be at lacrosse tournaments that would be weekend long, where you had five, six games, and you might be four games on a Saturday. And you, the, the inexperienced coaches, they were doing what Josh was talking about. They, they try to throw another practice round. You know, like the, those certain parents were like, come on, get up. You got you to be practicing. And the smartest people, the people who understand true mastery knew that it was actually those downtimes, which were the most beneficial, allow the kids to recover. Um, and we can use this all the time in our, in our adult life as well. And so what what you need to be able to do is get comfortable and know those times of rest actually allow you to deepen your richness when you are on or when you're competing. Um, and, And so it's really about understanding those different patterns when you can take advantage of time off, when you need to put your foot on the gas and, and go a little bit harder. Um, so, so this entire thing, we're going to dive now more into the entire process uh, of life working in oscillation. Um, and uh, I've really come to understand these little breaks as well in terms of competitive intensity, um, where it's really, really important, but being able to pull back. And Josh says, most people in high stress decision-making industries are always operating at this kind of simmering six, as opposed to an undulation between deep re- relaxation and being at a 10. Um, In order to switch on intensely, you need to switch off intensely. In order to focus 10 out of 10, you need your relaxation to be a zero out of 10. Build in a rest and recovery for all the elements of life. And and you can learn to control your ability to function in high stress situations. You can build um, what what he does is he actually builds in high intensity interval workouts. Um, He works with a lot of a lot of investing clients uh, to, to help them being able to maximize their performance. And what he'll do is he'll get them to do a high intensity sprint on a, on a treadmill, on a bike, something like that, just your heart rate spiked up as high as possible. And then based on breathing, slowing down technique techniques, how quickly can you get back to, to, to zero, right? Like that, that grounded calm state. And he says that the fields of learning and performance are an exploration of greatness of the in-between. This is the careful balance of pushing yourself relentlessly, but not so hard that you melt down. Muscles and minds need to stretch to grow, but if stretch too thin, they will snap. A competitor needs to be process oriented, always looking for stronger opponents to spur growth, but it's also important to keep on winning to maintain confidence, right? Like we, we, we always think, all right, strive more, get more tougher competitions, but we actually need that confidence as well. And so he goes on to say, we have to release our current ideas to soak in new material, but not so much that we lose touch with our unique natural talents. Vibrant, creative ideals need to be tempered by a practical technical awareness. And he brings up um, his partner in terms of they both own a jiu-jitsu gym, and that's Marcelo Garcia, who he claims is potentially the the greatest Brazilian jiu-jitsu grappler of all time. And what he said about Marcelo is just before world championship matches, minutes before, he would just be asleep, completely tuned off, turned off. 
Um, it's because he's trained so hard that the second he needed to go, he could completely rise to the moment. And I think that's just a, an incredible thing to think about. Um, uh, another one in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu world is Rickson Gracie, uh, also potentially one of the, the greatest Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, artists of all time. And what he said is that he actually worked so much on being able to get his heart rate prior to competition to such a low state where most people, right when a match begins, their heart rate spiking to 120, 130, <clears throat> excuse me, 140, 150, where when that person's already at 150, maybe a minute into, into a match, um, Rickson is, is down so low. And so he's only at 100. And so while people are, are wearing out their batteries quicker, he was able to get in such a, a relaxed, calm state prior that he's able to go and sustain that so much longer. And, and so we need to think that virtually every discipline, one of the most telling features of a dominant performer is the routine use of recovery periods. Um, and I didn't start understanding this until um, – I, I started studying even more in terms of elite performance across different sports. And you saw this a lot in tennis, or you do see this a lot in tennis. The best performers, one of the most common commonalities that they have is that they use and maximize their recovery breaks in between, where you might not even notice it as a, a, a viewer or a spectator, but that's what some of the best are doing. Um, and, and so learning how to to relax, to tap into the unconscious, to build recovery periods, we, we rarely think about the the slow recovery periods as an ability to tap into our unconscious um and that's crucial right it's like we get our best ideas in the shower because we're relaxed we're in that relaxed state and so the more times that we can build that right like that undulation process between full go and deep relaxation then not only as a physical competitor but as a mental competitor that's when we can bring out our true greatness and uncover our hidden talents. Um, so that's a, a really important principle. We, we could go on to that. Um, you, you could spend hours just, just going about that. I think it's really important. So understand, because I know it's hard to, when you want to slow down, that slowing down can actually lead to greater growth. So the next thing we're going to go talking about growth is the growth mindset. And so what growth mindset is um, essentially is, is there's fix um, and incremental theories of intelligence, right? And, and so what that means is a lot of times children are told they are smart. And what we should actually be doing is not telling a child they're smart because then what happens is they think that's a fixed state. You're born with it. How smart you are is how smart you are. Where we want kids with a growth mindset, we want people with a growth mindset where you achieved a certain score on a test because of how hard you worked, how hard you studied. And, and too much um, what we do is, is, is we don't allow that understanding, that growth mindset. And so Carol Dweck um, wrote a great book actually called Mindset, and she really dives into this. Um, so I, I would implore you guys to explore that further, her book, where you can get better continually. You can inc improve performance, increase performance, and not just when you're a child, um, not just early in life, but throughout life. And people with, with growth mindsets, um, they end up actually doing way better in life because they understand each opportunity is an ability to learn. Um, and it's not just it's not just a fixed thing. They can, they can keep getting better. You can adapt. And so when you face challenges, when you face setbacks, the, these, these emotional periods, when, when you're able to have a growth mindset, um, oh, wow, this is a really challenging time, but I understand what I can learn from it as opposed to, oh, man, I didn't do well on this test. I'm an idiot because I'm not smart, I cannot learn and develop. And as we know, growth comes to the point of resistance. And so we learn by pushing ourselves, um, exploring the, those possibilities or those untapped potentials within ourselves. And so it, it kind of comes down to, to focusing on process and not outcomes. Um, that, that's really the key to what it comes down to. And, and so what you'll see with these people with these growth mindsets um, is that they're constantly looking to push their boundaries. Um, they look for their, their edges and continue to push past them. And another thing that you see in, in any type of learning process, um, any growth period is you're going to hit plateaus. And so if you kind of think about how learning take, takes place, you might have this all of a sudden quick growth, no new information. And so what happens after that though, whether in sports in learning is you reach the plateau periods 
and it seems like nothing's happening, right? Like you're beating your head against the wall. You're not improving in your sport. You're, you're not able to grasp this concept. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, all of a sudden a step function improvement happens and whoa, it's like you're onto a whole new ability within growth, but that plateau period, that could be long. It could be hours. It could be days, weeks, months, and even certain times, years. But what ends up happening is the true greatest, the masters, they learn to love the plateaus because they know what's on the other end of this plateau where most novices, they reach these plateaus and they just can't face it. They're so frustrated. They're not, they're not ascending fast enough. They're not learning quick enough. And so what ends up happening is they stop, but the masters and Josh, they enjoy the plateaus because he knows on the other side of them is a massive spike in improvement. And if you can get comfortable with those plateaus, um, you're really going to be taking a huge step towards your ability to learn, your ability to develop. And Josh also hits on um, something that, that I think is important. And what do you learn from the people closest to you? And he says his mom's greatest gift. And I, I, what he says is, I think this is maybe the greatest gift that my mom gave me is having a sense of the agency in the world. The idea that having a sense that I can impact the world and that my compass really matters. So when I grew up, I wasn't seen, but not heard. When I was five and six, they were having adult conversations with friends and I was part of it. They wanted to hear my ideas and I felt that they mattered. As, as a parent to young children, this is one of the things I, I was really fortunate that my parents instilled this within me. Um, giving me a sense of agency in the world. But I think it's just so important, right? It gets back to that growth mindset we were talking about a minute ago. Um, if, if you know that you are able to go out there and you actually have an impact and grow, develop, um, it's just so crucial. Um, so I really like that. So an, another thing that Josh does is he does what's called a most important question journaling routine. And so he uses this with, with his clients. And so what they do at the end of their day, their work day, um, they, they pose a question into their mind, into their unconscious. And that's, what's the most important question in what I'm doing right now? So when you do that, you, your subconscious, your unconscious goes to work. And so throughout the rest of the evening, and then you go to sleep and that unconscious really starts like tingling, right? And then right when you wake up first thing in the morning, you just start free flow brainstorming onto a sheet of paper. And so this is really crucial um, in terms of uncovering certain patterns and principles. Um, and he thinks this is one of the crucial things that has helped unlock him over the years. Um, and, and so I, I would say, check this out, try this out. Um, what's the most important question um, that you're doing right now? And then that next morning, go ahead, journal just complete brainstorm on it um, and then start reviewing those and find out what those patterns are, what those commonalities are. Now, another really impactful moment for Josh was actually within recent years, he was swimming and doing breath holds, um, breath work. I, I know I've talked a lot in the past on uh, different breathing breath work patterns. One of the things I do is Wim Hof training. I love doing that um, in the morning and before physical activity. And so Josh was not being very smart here. He was doing long extended breath holds while swimming, something that you guys should never, ever do. And what ended up happening is he actually blacked out, went unconscious at the bottom of the pool for four minutes and someone pulled him out. But one of the things that this helped was you hear this a lot with people who experience near death experiences, um, the clarity they get. And he said, after that, I just decided that I would devote my life to living as fully and deeply and beautifully as possible and helping my loved ones live as fully and deeply and beautifully as they could and making as large and positive an impact on the world as I could. That was just all that mattered. And I'm just like, whoa, what an incredible thing, right? Um, here he's someone who's already brought so much to the world and just looking at life that way, like what if we all just started living a bit more fully and deeply and beautifully and really trying to have as much of an impact and create positive things within this world. Uh, I just really want to hit on this because I think that's just so important. And, and so some of the things that, that you can do <laughs> if you're not going to be in one of these, these life or death situations, I, I hope you're not, is you can pose the question, right? Like if I was going to die a year from now, what having left undone, wouldn't I be happy with? What would I regret not doing? What would I regret doing? And so I think exploring some of these questions um, thinking about just you're not immortal and, and that life will come to an end. I think this brings clarity and can really, really help you hone in on, on what is most important in life. And what, what Josh does um, is, is truly remarkable. I think he's someone we can learn so much from. And, and he has this life, 
or um, sorry, th- this quote in his book that I just really love. And he says, I think a life of ambition is like existing on a balance beam. As a child, there is no fear, no sense for the danger of falling. The beam feels wide and stable and natural playfulness allows for creative leaps and fast learning. You can run around doing somersaults and flips, always testing yourself with a love for discovery and new challenges. If you happen to fall off, no problem. You just get back on. But then as you get older, you become more aware of the risk of injury. Plunging off would be humiliating. A key component of high-level learning is cultivating a resilient awareness that is the older conscious embodiment of a child's playful obliviousness. This journey from child back to child again is at the very core of my understanding of success. I think this is just so important, right? Like let's, as we advance, as we get older, maintain that childlike sense of possibility and curiosity. And when we do that, when we approach things from a beginner mind and that exploratory nature, then we, we can put our ego aside. We uncover so much more uh, in what's possible. And so I, I just think that's so key. I, I just really wanted to hit on that um, as we're concluding here. And what we're going to do now is we're actually going to dive into Josh's 20 principles of learning. Um, I'll, just, I'll just hit on these quickly. And so for the first one is, is resilience. Um, and so that's basically value process before results. True learning occurs through a process of hard and sustained effort and a nuanced understanding of each challenge, gain, and loss along the way. Therefore, it's more important to draw insights from every step we take rather than focus on any end reward or goal. Labels like winner, loser, smart or dumb ignore this fact and should be avoided. They lock our sense of ourselves in place, strip us of motivation, and make it difficult, if not impossible, to keep on going and evolving. The next principle is investment in loss. And so we expand our minds and develop our capacities by allowing ourselves to confront hurdles, experience losses, and take a good hard look at them. Although stepping away from what is known and familiar and taking risks can be uncomfortable, doing so affords rich opportunities for learning. A willingness to lose and analyze the loss, as well as unsettled feelings that accompany it, cultivates flexibility. This in turn allows us to move forward and gain additional wisdom, no matter what we may encounter along our path. The next principle is beginner's mind. Children learning to crawl approach the surroundings with unstoppable curiosity and eager, joyful sense of adventure. They have no concern for how they look or the judgments of others. What propels them forward is a general delight in all that is unfamiliar, an ability to be intrigued by the mundane, and a desire to probe the minutest details along their path over and over again. The best learning results from this kind of openness, from being fully awake to experiences at hand, receptive to gaining even tiny insights from it, and to refining one's method and response. It's an inner willingness to adopt the non-resistant approach of a beginner and gradually perfect one knowledge, um, manifest outwardly as forward movement and over time as graceful expertise. The, the next principle is using adversity. And that's being able to handle life's dirty tricks without losing one's equanimity, interest, and joy is vital to learning and achievement. The ability to call on one's knowledge and apply it well and completely is disrupted when we fall prey to emotional disturbances. So rather than deny or stifle emotions, we must work to gain an understanding of them, learn to make peace with them, and ultimately channel them into the right higher levels of performance. By keeping our cool under trying conditions, we can arrive at precise conclusions and take positive and effective action at all times, especially during the most complicated and critical moments. The next principle is the internal solution. And if we can prevent ourselves from being thrown by heightened emotions, instead learn to flow with them, the, the psychological response they produce in us can help us defeat obstacles and you know, to harness feelings for a defined purpose. We must first develop an understanding of and tolerance for our inner turmoil. We should learn to observe our passions, understand their sources, their unique character. Then we will be able to transform them into creative inspiration for successful action. And and once we have an in-depth awareness of our personality and the ways we react to external stimuli, we can use our minds to evoke a powerful internal psychological state at will and channel it to great advantage. advantage. The next principle is peak performance. And that basically comes down to the power of presence. And we enrich our experience of life by attuning ourselves to its subtlest aspects and delving deeply into its details. One cannot excel at a pursuit or experience its delights by bringing a skimming approach to it or handling related responsibilities in that shallow manner. To excel, our perspective must be 
that everything is on the line at all times, and we must maximize each and every moment's potential. To do so demands that we be fully present and engaged at every stage of our relationships, studies, and work, not just in the moments we think are critical, but also in the moments leading up to them. And then there is no one to look in, no one to give feedback or cheer us on. A keen but relaxed focus will enable us to motivate and monitor ourselves. And that's what's crucial, right? Like that inner motivation. So the next up is the soft zone. And life is full of random, unexpected events and demands. And it is vital that we gain awareness and understanding of our reactions to these intrusions in order to cultivate an ability to remain calm and collected when they arise. To maximize our ability to develop and draw on our knowledge base, we should not brace against disruptions and the emotions they stir, but rather adopt a non-resistant attitude. This allows us to absorb information, process it smoothly and quickly, take appropriate action, and grow from the experience. We become resilient in the way a flexible blade of grass can bend and sustain most any kind of assault. With a stiffened and strained approach to upheaval, however large or small, we cannot sustain focus and call on our full wisdom. We become brittle and lose our ability to clear the hurdles like a dry stick snapping under pressure. The next principle is the downward spiral. And what ends up happening is when we cling to the troubling emotions that result from an obstacle or loss, we abandon the present for the past. In short order, we find ourselves using our personal resources to wage an internal war instead of using them to handle what is going on now and move forward. And by focusing on past problem, it becomes easy to believe that things have taken a turn for the worse. In not being awake to the present, we magnify the original loss, allowing it to produce a ripple effect of additional problems. These in turn take us even further off course of growth, and we must stay cool under fire and fully in the present to glean the most we can from every experience and achieve success. The next one is, is one we've hit on, and that's stress and recovery. And the natural world embodies a rhythm of action and inaction that enables plants and animals to muster the energies they require for sustenance and growth. You know, bears enter caves and hibernate in the winter. Plants, too, enter a dormant phase during which biological processes occur that make it possible for them to reemerge in the spring. And by alternating cycles of rest with activities that push us to the outer limits of our abilities, we strengthen the bond between mind and body in a way that fuels peak ability, high-level learning, and performance. Because all aspects of our lives are interconnected, the practice of stress and recovery should be incorporated into everything we take on. All experiences will be enriched as a result. Effective methods include meditation, stretching, deep breathing, play, even washing one's face. By conditioning ourselves to move fluidly between intervals of tension and serenity, it becomes possible to condense the duration of recovery time needed for learning and exertion. We become more able to rally our powers of intuition and creativity and call on our knowledge and skills at a moment's notice. The next principle is to build your trigger. And every one of us has one or more activities or experiences that can lead us towards serenity. And to create our own catalyst for peak performance, first we must identify the one key activity that is most relaxing for us. Then shape a simple routine comprising this and four to five additional personal relaxation methods you know work for you. Practice this routine daily for one month during downtime to entrench a calm state of mind. Um, if you can only identify a single activity that leads you to serenity, shape a routine of simple activities to practice before or after your own relaxation producer. And so after a month of practice, the soothing psychological benefits of your key activity will have sufficed the routine. You will be able to use the routine to produce a state of calmness, even when the key activity is not part of it. Um, the way this has kind of come out in my own life is I mentioned some of the breathing routines I've done. And so it used to take me a number of minutes to get myself into a calmer state with the breathing, where now I can essentially do it in one deep breath that literally just gets me in this deep mind state where I'm completely calm, but attuned and aware. Um, and so this is one you can continue to work on within yourself. Um, so the next up is, is being able to listen to first. And the, the first step to artful teaching is tuning into the essence of the student. It is critical that we appreciate each individual's unique learning style and natural voice and take these into account when instructing them. And by allowing students to express themselves through their learning process and what they learn, we not only expand their capabilities, but also their interests forging ahead. 
And teachers have a very fine line to walk in preserving in their students a balance between passion and discipline, analysis and internalization of fact and technique. And this balancing act demands that they neither offer false compliments nor dismiss seemingly wayward ideas, but rather prompt probing discussion of a student's ideas and methods and coach them in a manner that is in keeping with who they are. A sensitive, tailored teaching strategy accompanied by a clearly expressed expectation of achievement can make the difference between helping students' minds carve themselves into maturity and stripping them of this ability as well as their joy. Teachers who position themselves more as guides to development than as an omniscient authority end up promoting in pupils a lifelong hunger for absorbing, processing, and applying knowledge effectively. And then we've got loving the game. And so as children, we have a natural love for discovery and new challenges. Learning and ambition are playful, adventurous, rather than dizzying experiences fraught with a sense of danger. Whenever we fall, we get right back up again. But as we mature, we begin to attack a sense of risk and fear or attach a sense of risk and fear to learning and performance. And we seek comfort of old knowledge and methods. And to learn and perform at increasingly higher levels, especially under stressful circumstances, we must reconnect to our experiences of use, youth, to those times when our natural approach to discovery was lighthearted. And being a beginner and a learner was really joyful. And at the core of success lies the journey from childhood back to childhood again. It is by taking this journey that we can discover how to maintain a harmonious balance between our pursuits and our own unique disposition. Another one is breaking down the walls. And themes that arise in one area of our personal lives also surface in other areas. All the aspects of life are interconnected, and the ability to learn and perform in consistently effectual ways is therefore impacted by our general state of mind. It is vital that we unearth the psychological patterns and emotional responses that get in the way of our success and take our weaknesses on. <clears throat> by bringing awareness to the threads connecting mind and action, we can actually break down the walls between desperate parts of our lives that we have mentally built up and take corrective steps to transform all weaknesses into strength. So next up is actually more on the intuition and that's around developing the internal compass. And so to truly excel, we must cultivate access to intuition, the bridge between the conscious and the unconscious mind that is the wellspring of our creativity. We can achieve this um, access by alternating deep and repetitive study at the highest possible level with periods of rest and relaxation. When we connect with our intuition, we are calling into service a part of our brain that can perceive the interconnections between vast amounts of technical knowledge and instantaneously harmonize them into a single creative solution. And the, the next one is the middle way, and that's navigating grayness. And to maximize learning and use the knowledge we gain to perform at a high level, we must be willing to engage in a process that pushes us to the outer edges of our abilities, yet does not stretch us so thinly that we run the risk of breaking down. Ideally, we will allow the bar to move just a bit higher with each step we take along this balanced middle road, just enough to engage our capacities fully and let us experience some success. Um, so this approach can spur us to an additional growth and wins. And in order to strike a balance between pushing ourselves forward and preserving a sense of wholeness, we must be willing to let go of our prior notions of adequacy and pursue a strategy of growth that upholds our unique learning styles, as well as the passion that give expression to who we really are. And so some of these advanced learning styles and some of these final principles are to master the fundamentals. And it's most effective <clears throat> to launch into a learning process by studying a discipline's most fundamental principles and a devotion to mastering the nuances of these basics builds the foundation required for more complex understanding, creative bursts of inspirations, and higher levels of achievement, which result from an interplay between knowledge, intuition, and creativity. By studying and deeply internalizing core concepts, we develop our brain in ways that allow us to achieve a more penetrating understanding of not just one subject or practice, but also all others we choose to undertake. As we immerse ourselves in doing what it takes to absorb and build on fundamentals, we experience firsthand the joy of learning and reinforce for ourselves its value. Allowing ourselves to grasp the intrinsic benefit of personal development through what we do to achieve enhances our motivation and equips us to take further learning. We also 
we need to learn the macro from the micro, and that's we cannot hope to grasp the inherent joy and beauty of learning, nor lead a life of serious accomplishment if we only skim the surface of subjects and acquaint ourselves with thin layers of knowledge. In order to excel, our approach to learning must emphasize depth over breadth. We have to resist the attraction to the superficial stimulation that our media-driven society cultivates. This alternative is to dive deeply into small pools of information in order to explore and experience the operating principles of whatever we are learning. Once we grasp the essence of our subject through focused study of core principles, we can build on nuanced insights and eventually see a much bigger picture. The essence of this approach is to study the micro in order to learn what makes the macro tick. And another one we did hit on is making smaller circles. And we have to be able to do something slowly before we can do it quickly. By delving with laser-like focus into a basic set of concepts or practices over a period of time, we can gradually internalize the knowledge. The process of reviewing and creatively exploring the, these basics over and over again leads to a very refined, nuanced understanding of them. We eventually integrate the principles into our subconscious mind where we can draw on them instinctively and rapidly without conscious thought getting in the way. This deeply ingrained knowledge base can serve as a meaningful springboard for more advanced learning and action. Similar to uh, when, when you're driving, right? Like it's unconscious at this point because you've internalized it to such a far degree. And another principle is numbers to leave numbers. And by studying discrete pieces of information thoroughly and practicing their application repetitively, they eventually shed their technical nitty gritty character. Um, this happens because the process of digesting small chunks of knowledge over and over shifts it from the conscious mind to the unconscious mind, where it can connect with other chunks of internalized knowledge and manifest as the sudden burst of insight we experience as free-flowing intuition. This high level of knowledge integration is what we should aim for. It allows us to access what we have committed to learning in a fluid, precise, and improvisational manner. And so just to kind of bring all of this together, these are the steps to high-level learning and performance. Uh, delve into the essential aspects of a small pool of basic information that is foundational to your chosen, chosen topic or field, and do so in a manner that is keeping with your unique learning style. Building on this base, devote yourself to exploring new, ever more advanced sets of information and technique that lie at the outer edge of your ability or understanding. And you want to alternate such periods of pushing yourself to your limit with periods of rest and relaxation that foster recovery and creativity. By approaching learning in this way, your internalized knowledge will lead to bursts of insights and discovery, which you can expand further by breaking down the mechanics that lead to your achievements. Eventually, you will come to recognize the feeling that a refined and integrated body of knowledge produces in you, and you will be able to target the recreation of this feeling as you pursue new subject areas. So I know this was a lot, uh, threw a ton of information at you here in the distillation of Josh Waitzkin. Now, remember, all of this and way, way more can be found at whatgotyouthere.com under the distillery tab. And there you can find the distillation of Josh Waitzkin and all the other distillations that we do. If you want early previews of these um, and be the first one to get them when they come out the first of each month, you can also sign up for our Momentum Monday newsletter at whatgotyouthere.com and you'll be the first one to receive these. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you can learn this. Remember, approach things from a childlike sense of wonder, sense of curiosity, be willing to be at peace in the chaos, right? Like the hard things are going to come at us. Be fine with that. Be willing to accept that. Take that on. Um, continually push your boundaries, your limits, what you're capable of. Um, and know this is a journey. This is a lifelong journey, this learning journey we're all on. So I hope you guys enjoyed the distillation of Josh Waitzkin. What got you there with got you, got you, what got you there with Shonda?